I had prostate cancer, and now I don't. That's what I'm talking about on this episode of the Driving with Rob podcast. It's a story I've wanted to tell for a long time. It's an important story, and hopefully it'll help somebody. If you have or know someone who has prostate cancer, you need to listen to this story. Now, I'm not working from notes, so bear with me. Of course, I never work with notes, or very rarely. But anyway, here's the story. I'm going to go back to the beginning. And just to let you know, all men have a prostate, a prostate gland. It starts growing during puberty. And you may have heard of BPH. BPH just means prostate enlargement. You've probably heard of prostate enlargement. And the technical term for it is BPH benign prostate hyperplasia. But anyway, that pretty much happens to all men as they get older. Uh, The statistics that I read, they're really easy to remember. It says by age 50, 50% of all men have some degree or another of prostate enlargement. By age 70, 70% of men have some degree of prostate enlargement. Doctors don't really know why and don't really know what to do about it. But there is another issue that does happen to some men, and that's prostate cancer. One of the tools that the doctors use to determine whether or not you are developing prostate cancer or not is something in your blood work called the PSA test. Prostate-specific antigen. That's what PSA stands for. Your prostate creates this antigen that they can detect in blood work. As your prostate gets bigger, your PSA number goes up. Because if you have more mass, then you have more antigen being produced. If it gets too high, or if there's a sharp spike in your PSA number, that may indicate a potential for prostate cancer. It's not a definitive test, but it is an early indicator. And I encourage men, especially men over 50, go get your blood work. Go get your blood test and see what your PSA number is. Now, they say for a 50-year-old man, 50 years old and older, that a normal prostate PSA number should be between 4 and 6. If it's between 4 and 6, they don't get overly concerned about it. Well, over the last probably 15 years, maybe 20 years, my PSA number has gradually gone up. And the doctor, during the normal prostate exam, and all men know what that exam is, the doctor had told me, you do have a certain degree of prostate enlargement, but it's nothing to worry about. But my numbers kept getting bigger. They never spiked, but they kept going up gradually over time. And over several years, they had finally gotten to 92 which, again, 4 to 6 is a normal number. At 9.2, my primary care doctor said it's large enough now that we need to investigate, that we need to look a little further. So he referred me to a urologist. The urologist scheduled an MRI, and he said there is a concerning spot on your MRI. But even that is not an indicator of prostate cancer. We don't know for sure until we do a biopsy. So they schedule the biopsy. I had the biopsy. And in January of 2022, I was diagnosed 
with prostate cancer. And just like everybody else, when you hear the C word, when you hear cancer, you freak out. I freaked out a little. I, I didn't really freak out. I was just, just kind of stunned and kind of numb by it. You know, how could I possibly have cancer? But here it is. They did the biopsy. They confirmed it is prostate cancer. And he told me, this doctor told me, he said, now, like a lot of prostate cancers, a lot but not all, it is the slower growing type of cancer and a type of cancer that is not prone to spread. And this is what they learned from the biopsy, from uh, the cells they collected. It is cancer, but it's the slower growing type and you have time to make a decision as to what to do about it. Well, this doctor's recommendation was prostate removal. And I said, let me think about it. So I went back to my primary care doctor and I said, can you get me an appointment with a different urologist? I want to get a second opinion. So I went to a second urologist and took all my paperwork with me. And without doing any additional tests, he said, I agree with the first doctor. You need to have your prostate removed. So now I have cancer and they want to remove my prostate. I got a second opinion. Second opinion told me the same thing. Well, I just happened to mention to a friend of mine from work that I had gotten a positive cancer diagnosis and they want to remove my prostate. Well, he told me, he said, well, you know, Mike had his prostate removed. And I said, no, I didn't know Mike had his prostate removed. See, this is one of those things where men don't talk about it. They just don't. I don't know if it's the, the embarrassment of it. You know, the prostate is basically your, uh, I don't want to say primary, but maybe it is primary sex organ. And they're taking it out. Most men don't talk about it even with other men. And once they take it out, you're not a man anymore. Or that's how you feel. A woman can have a hysterectomy. Her whole family knows about it. All of her friends know about it. Everybody on Facebook knows about it. But if a man has his prostate removed, only his closest family and friends know about it. So once I found out that Mike had had prostate cancer and had his prostate removed. I went and talked to Mike. And I said, dude, what's the deal? I had no idea. And Mike had an office. Mike said, come in and close the door. So I came in and Mike started telling me his whole story. And basically uh, what they had done for Mike was you have prostate cancer Let's go ahead and schedule your prostate removal now. No time to think about it. The best course of treatment is to take your prostate out. So Mike went straight from his consultation with the doctor to the lady who schedules the surgeries just right down the hall. And Mike told me he didn't have time to think about it. They didn't give him time to think about it. And I said, well, my doctor made the mistake of telling me I had time. So I'm trying to gather all the information I can so I can make the best decision. And Mike told me something that became the driving force behind every decision I made after that, which was, don't let them take your prostate out. If there's any other treatment that you can take, that doesn't involve prostate removal, do that first. And then through the conversation, through the course of the conversation with Mike, found out that we had several mutual friends that had had prostate removal. 
So I talked to a couple of those guys, and they told me the same thing Mike told me. Don't let them take your prostate out. If it's the difference between life and death, then yeah, you're out of options. But if you have any other option, if you have any other treatment, do that first. And as it turns out, our mutual friend Anthony had prostate cancer. So I called Anthony and I talked to him. Well, Anthony's situation was a little different. Anthony's PSA number had a radical spike, like doubled, maybe almost tripled within a year. And mine had only gone up by like 0.1, 0.2 every year for several years. But Anthony's had a giant spike. And he said, basically, they told him, we have to do an emergency prostate removal and hope it's not too late. Because apparently my friend Anthony had the type that does spread and that is aggressive. And Anthony had his prostate removed. And I talked to Anthony after his procedure. And this was, I think, in the fall of 2022. Ask him how he was doing. You know, just checking up on him like a friend would do. And he was telling me, you know, all the things they did to him. And they think they got it all, he said. I was not only calling Anthony to see how he was doing. I had a decision of my own to make, prostate removal or not. Well, one of the other guys that I talked to said he didn't know the name of the place or the name of the doctor. But there's a guy in Florida who does some kind of a laser procedure. And I had a friend who went down there, had this procedure. They did not remove his prostate, and he's been cancer-free for 10 years. So all I had to go on was prostate cancer, laser, Florida. That's all I knew. So I started Googling. I started doing my own research, trying to find this doctor, trying to find out what kind of procedure he does and all that stuff. And I found his website, and there was testimonial after testimonial of real guys who had basically been told the same thing I did. Went and got a second opinion. Got told the same thing. Prostate removal is your only option. Then I found this guy. And I've been cancer-free ever since. So I got really, really interested in it. And I sent him an email. You know, the, uh, you, know you click on the contact us kind of a thing. And they replied and basically said, you know, get your paperwork together, get your biopsy reports, your MRI reports, and uh, send them to us, and we'll take a look at it and see if you're a good candidate for this procedure. So I kind of thought about it and thought this may be a better option than prostate removal. And plus, you know, the, uh, the two urologists that I went to see did tell me that there are other options that you can do a cryogenic freezing procedure, uh, an isotope seeding procedure, some kind of a, uh, a thermal, you know, burning thing that they do. But both of these urologists said those procedures aren't the best option for you and gave me reasons why these were not good procedures for me. So I knew about other procedures, but I wasn't taking what they told me at face value and just accepting it. So the last conversation I had with my friend Anthony was in the fall of 2022. Then I got a call from Mike. Mike said, did you hear about Anthony? I said, no, what about him? The cancer had spread to other parts of his body. He's doing chemo and radiation now. I said, no, I didn't know. I said, should I call him? And Mike said, well, 
Anthony's very weak from the chemo and radiation. He probably won't feel like talking to you. So I said, okay. And I think it was around April of 2023, just a few months after the last time I spoke to Anthony, my wife and I attended Anthony's funeral. The radiation and chemo seemed to be helping, but then he took a turn for the worse and died. But it started out as prostate cancer. And now I have prostate cancer. So I called those people in Florida back. I said, what was it that you wanted from me? We want your biopsy report. We want a copy of the MRI, copy of your blood work, any medical information you can send us. And we'll decide if you're a good candidate for this procedure or not. So I gathered all that stuff and I sent it to the Sperling Prostate Center in Delray Beach, Florida. And after a week, maybe a couple of weeks, I get a call from the Sperling Prostate Center. And the lady I spoke to said, Dr. Sperling would like to speak to you personally if you have time right now. I said, I will make time. Yes, let me talk to him. So I talked to the doctor. And he said, well, what we need to do, he said, it looks like you are a good candidate for this procedure. Now, the procedure was called, or is called, focused laser ablation. And from the images that we saw and from all your information, it looks like you are a good candidate for this procedure. We don't need to take your prostate out. When can you come down? And he gave me all the information that, that he could over the phone. He said, what we need to do is we need to get you down here and get you in our MRI machine. Because our machine is better than most hospitals. And we can take a look at it and we can pinpoint exactly where the cancer is. And we can take care of it. I said, okay. So I knew I was going to need somebody to drive for me. So we drove to Delray Beach, Florida. 12-hour trip by car. And before I scheduled the procedure, I asked him, I said, am I going to be able to ride in a car for 12 hours? And they said, sure. Once you have the procedure, you're good to go. I'm like, okay. Because they had already told me for prostate removal, it was going to be weeks of recovery time. And a good portion of your recovery time, you were going to be bedridden. You were going to need help getting in and out of the bed. It's a major surgery to take your prostate out. And just a word before I go any further. The side effects of prostate removal is you have ED and some degree of incontinence for the rest of your life. Some people have it really bad. Some people have it not so bad. But there's going to be some. Best case scenario, if we take your prostate out, you're going to leak. You're going to have bladder leakage. And the doctor, I guess, in an attempt to reassure me, said, oh, it's not that bad. It's like a woman after she has a baby. If you sneeze really hard, if you cough really hard, if you laugh really hard, you're going to leak some urine. Well, to me, that didn't seem like a small deal. That seemed like a big deal. And the chances of you having permanent sexual dysfunction are very low. This is what the doctor told me, what the urologist told me. Well, during my research, after my friend Anthony passed away, I came across this website that said, don't let them take your prostate out. <laughs> and that was basically what Mike had told me. So I started reading this article. And this article this man had written said, it's not that the urologists are lying to you. It's the people who manufacture and sell the surgical robot 
is lying to the doctors. When the doctors tell you 90% full recovery, that's what the surgical robot people told the doctors. Truth of the matter is, 40% or less of men who have prostate removal have anything close to a full recovery that is actually probably closer to 30%, but you're never going to have 100% function again. And so that was another reason to call this guy in Florida. Because the testimonials that I watched said they had better function after focused laser ablation. And these testimonials were regular guys just like me who have been told your only option is prostate removal. So the wife and I made the 12-hour car trip to Delray Beach, Florida. My procedure was scheduled for July 5th. So we went down a couple days early, had a little time at the pool, a little time on the beach, spent the 4th of July in Delray Beach, Florida, watched the fireworks from the top of the hotel that we were staying at. It was great. And then that morning, July the 5th, went to the prostate center, the Sperling Prostate Center. And I won't give you all the details, but I'll hit some salient points with you. We go down there. He said, first of all, we've got to get you into the MRI machine because we need to map your prostate. We need to find out exactly where this tumor is. And it may have grown, it may have shifted since your last MRI because my last MRI was in January of 2022. And now here we are, July 5th, 2023. We just want to make sure that we're seeing everything we need to see. Okay. So the first step in the process was they put me in the MRI machine. Brings me into his office and he goes over the MRI images. And he said, you see this right here? I said, yeah. He said, this is your bladder. The smaller structure in front of it is your prostate. If you notice underneath the bladder and the prostate, there are two things that look like cables or ropes. And he said, these are the two nerve bundles that split right there to go down each leg. And he said these nerve bundles also control bladder function and sexual function. And he said, look at this picture. He said, you see the two nerve bundles coming underneath the prostate and smaller nerves that are kind of wrapped around the prostate. Kind of like roots of a plant growing around a rock. He said, you look at this picture and you tell me how they can take a prostate out and not cause permanent nerve damage. He said, I don't see how they can do it, but they claim they can. He said, from these images, he said, you see this discoloration right here. And he pointed to the top farthest away from the nerve bundles. He said, you see this discoloration on the image? This is your tumor. He said, I can go in with a laser and kill that tumor and never get close to your nerve bundle. You should retain full function. As a matter of fact, where this tumor is located is pressing against your urethra. And once we kill it, you should have better flow almost immediately. Then he said, this is your last chance to back out. If you want me to do the procedure, we will do the procedure after lunch. But if you want to take more time and think about it and look at other options, he says, you're welcome to do so. But if you say yes, I'm going to have you sign the forms and we'll take you in in about an hour or so and do this procedure. 
And I told the doctor, I've already done all my research. That's what led me to you. Let's do it. Pull the trigger. So they prepped me for this procedure. And, of course, one of the first things they do to you is they catheterize you. And I won't go into the gory details of that. But just in general, you think that you're going to get a nurse who says, oh, I'm sorry, I know it hurts. Oh, no. Oh, no. I got a nurse who was feeding this thing in like she was snaking a clogged drain. The only words of comfort I got was almost there. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. But anyway, they said the reason we catheterize you is because when we hit this tumor with the laser, it's going to cause a little bit of inflammation around the surrounding tissue, and we don't want the tube from your bladder to close up just because everything around it swelled up due to the inflammation caused by this laser. So they gave me the drugs. They didn't put me to sleep. But the drugs made me so sleepy that I went to sleep. So here I am. I'm, I'm in, the, uh, in to have the procedure. And basically what the procedure is, you're inside an MRI machine. And the MRI is continuously running as he's targeting the tumor with the laser. And he can watch it on the screen in real time. And wherever that X shows up, He hits it with a laser. He pushes the button and lasers it, kills it. The whole procedure took about two and a half hours. Got up to leave the clinic. They gave me some instructions. Talked about the catheter. Said you can remove the catheter yourself. That it's not not a problem. Uh, Most people do. Or you can go to the hospital and they can take it out for you. But we want you to leave that catheter in for seven days. So for seven days, I had a bag strapped to my leg and a catheter. That was the worst part of the whole procedure. We're going to have you on restricted duty for about 30 days. We don't want you lifting anything heavy. We don't want you doing anything strenuous for about 30 days. But after 30 days, you should be good to go. I'm like, okay. So seven days go by and take the catheter out and of course i watched a youtube video on how to take it out before i took it out but it hurt a lot less coming out than it did going in trust me on this and after about two weeks they called uh, the sperling prostate center called checked on me to see how i was doing how i was feeling any problems you know have you seen any blood has there been you know anything unusual and i said no you know Still feel a little weird, but, you know, no worse for wear. I'm okay. So after about 30 days, they called and checked on me again, and they said, yeah, you can go back to normal activity now. Said the 30 days is just to make sure that uh, this tissue that we lasered didn't start bleeding, you know, but after 30 days, you should be good. You should be healed up and ready to go. So... This was in July. So in August, I had my regular blood work. And my primary care doctor said, according to your PSA number, you no longer have cancer. Your PSA number is down to 4.6. And I still have a prostate. They didn't take it out. They didn't damage the prostate. And the Sperling Prostate Center had told me, they said, if it ever comes back, there's a good chance we could do this procedure again and still not have to remove your prostate. I don't have cancer. They didn't remove my prostate. And I don't have any of the side effects because they didn't remove my prostate. So the reason I wanted to do this episode of the podcast If you have prostate cancer, 
or if you know someone who does, or someone who thinks they might. I'm going to give you the same advice that my friend Mike gave me. Don't let them take your prostate out. Unless it's a last resort, unless that's the only thing they can do to save your life, don't let them take your prostate out. And the other thing is, if you're at least 50 years old and you're not getting regular blood tests, you need to start getting regular blood tests. And you need to watch that PSA number. See, I'm thinking that I probably had prostate cancer for years and just didn't know it because I had the slower growing, less aggressive, less prone to spreading type of prostate cancer. But I think I had cancer for years before they ever checked it. Because most prostate cancer is slow growing. You may not necessarily know that you have it. And if you look at some of the websites, they say sometimes when a person has prostate cancer, they don't do anything for it. Sometimes when a man has prostate cancer, if he's older, like in his 70s and certainly in his 80s, they may not treat it at all. Because if it is the slower growing type, something else will kill you before the prostate cancer does. You'll have a heart attack or a stroke. But if you suspect that you may have prostate cancer, don't take we have to remove your prostate as your only option. I had two different urologists tell me that was my best option. I became my own advocate. I found my own treatment. I found my own doctor. And I have none of the side effects, none of the additional surgeries that come with prostate removal. I don't have nerve damage. Don't let them take your prostate out. Do your research. If it's the difference between life or death, then yeah, you do what you have to do. But you do have options, and don't let them tell you that you don't, because you do. Pass this along if you have family members, male family members in their 50s who may have this issue. Make sure they listen to this podcast. Make sure that you're aware that you have other options, because ultimately you are your own best health care advocate. Nobody is looking out for you. You have to look out for yourself. And I hope this podcast episode helps because this is me looking out for you. little different topic on the podcast today, but I wanted to share that with you. I've been wanting to share it for a long time. It is my personal prostate story, and I wanted to share it with you. It's not a death sentence, and you do have options. Thanks for listening. Thanks for downloading. I'll talk to you next time. Bye now.